for every hundred murders that happens in Lexington, I'd say the homicide unit knows who did it 90, 95 percent of the time. Warning, the podcast you're about to listen to may contain graphic descriptions of violent assaults, murder, and adult language. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast, Code Case Investigations with Detective Rob Wilson, Part 1 of 2. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast. I'm David. In the next two episodes, we're going to take the listeners through a journey and an educational trip on learning about cold case investigations. To do this, we have asked Detective Rob Wilson to return to the Murder Police Podcast. Listeners will remember him from other cases that we've covered. Detective Wilson just retired before we recorded this from the Lexington Police Department and was the last cold case investigator when he left. Three top things to listen for in this podcast. One is Detective Wilson is going to talk about what a cold case is, how they become cold, how they are selected for investigation, and the challenges in those. Additionally, we had asked listeners before that if they could ask a cold case investigator one question about the missing case of Melanie Flynn in Lexington, Kentucky, what would that question be? And Detective Wilson is going to answer those listener questions. And finally, we're going to talk about Gabby Petito without really talking about Gabby. This tragic case of the young woman that was found murdered has been covered very well across the country in virtually every news outlet and by many other true crime podcasts. What we're going to talk about in this case, though, is the amateur detectives, because this case of Gabby Petito really brought that to the forefront of a lot of people's attention. Detective Wilson is going to talk about how he feels about getting assistance from people in the community and offer advice for people who do have their heart in the right place and are trying to make a difference. With that, let's get to the interview with Detective Rob Wilson and talk about cold case investigations. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast. Today, we are talking with Detective Rob Wilson. Rob, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me again. David, how are you over there? Doing good. This is going to be a super show for everybody that's interested in homicide investigations. Well, for those listeners who have not heard Rob on our show before, he's done two shows previously, which I highly encourage you to listen to. But Rob, why don't you tell us a little bit about your history? Well, I've basically been in Lexington my entire life. Went to Lafayette High School, then University of Kentucky, then got on to the police department around 1998. Did three years in patrol. The next 20 years were in the homicide unit, and I just retired last Friday. Well, congratulations on that retirement. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome to the 15th of the month club. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. I got bored the other day. I was stuck in the parking garage. I was like, how many hours is 23 years? And I gave uh, roughly five hours of overtime, generously, I think, for each week. Came out to close to 75,000 hours that I've worked as a police officer. And uh, it was just, that was mind boggling. Oh, that is. I never thought of it in that aspect, but that's pretty spooky, actually. Well, I mean, we do have some that stayed on. I won't mention any names, but, you know, look, guys, there's some that have been there for 37 years. You could have done it, Rob. Not a chance. Yeah, it's not a marathon (laughs) or a contest. It really isn't. Trust me. Well, Rob, do you feel comfortable talking about what your next venture is? Yeah, I'm just going to take some time right now and uh, look into maybe doing some contract work for investigations. Very nice. Well, tell us a little bit about that career. And that was a quick exit from patrol into investigations. I I know back at the police department, by contract, you have to have three years. But back then, we didn't have a contract. So getting in that early was definitely a hat tip to who you are, because they don't ask you in early if if they don't think you're going to work out. But Take us through what that looked like on the the evolution of becoming a homicide detective and how you developed in that. Well, um, as soon as I decided I wanted to make law enforcement my career, the being a homicide detective was the end goal. 
that's what I wanted. And I figured I'd have to, I just assumed everybody wanted to be a homicide detective. And so I, once I looked into it, I knew I had to do three years on patrol. Wasn't really happy about that, but I knew I had to do it. And come to find out, I really enjoyed it. And to be a homicide detective, you have to be a patrol officer and an active one. And then, you know, one that's engaged in your sector, your beat. That's where I learned how to talk to people. That's where I got my confidential informants. So it was essential that three years in there, I gained so much knowledge that I didn't even really know I was learning at the time. Uh, Just interacting with different people, different races, different genders, different neighborhoods, different socioeconomic variations. And but, you know, the three years came up and an opening came up in robbery homicide. I didn't think I get it. I was still pretty young or whatever. And I don't remember how many people I interviewed against, but went through the process. And, you know, I got the call from John Dixon, I believe, was the lieutenant over homicide at the time. He called me up and said I got the spot. So I was super excited. And then I got really scared. Yeah, because you're you, you're there. And by the way, John Dixon was probably one of my favorite bosses in my career. So a big shout out to John. He he was an amazing guy to work for. Yeah. Well, let me take it back a little bit. You said that from the time you decided to be the police, did, answer two things. Why did you want to get into policing? And even more so, what interested you in death investigation? Because I think the listeners, for the most part in our audience, have that interest in this wrapping their minds around that? Can you detail that? Because I'll bet that they have the same interest in some aspects. You know, I I never really thought about it, but I think if you break it down, it's the little boy in me that wanted to play cops and robbers, you know? And then when I decided that was going to be my profession, if I'm going to go catch bad guys, I want to go after the worst of the worst. I want to get the monsters. And so that was just kind of my drive all along. And Yeah, I'm really glad I did it because it was an extremely rewarding career. Did you use the word you got scared when you got in? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I have a lot of reverence for that position. And once you go into homicide, it is a steep learning curve. You know, you make one mistake and maybe a killer gets away. It's not like, you know, I'm not downplaying any other unit, but if you're in another unit that's dealing with property or something like that, then if you make a mistake, then maybe somebody just doesn't get their lawnmower back. You know, so these, you know, you're dealing with, and we had sex crimes at the time. So if you make a mistake, collect a piece of evidence that you shouldn't have simply by a mistake because you're new and that becomes inadmissible, but that was part of your probable cause to charge. Eight months later, you lose that at a suppression hearing, then they may have to drop the charges altogether. So I asked a lot of questions. The people in the unit at that time were fantastic. They had a lot of experience. James Curlis, Paul Williams, Chris Schoonover. They were great. They really took me under their wing, and I learned from the best. Absolutely. And talking about learning, and I think I know the answer, but you agree. Do you have a lot of spin-up time when you get up there, or are you pretty much thrown into the fire? Thrown into the fire. Amen. It, it's And a lot of people don't, I don't think they appreciate that sometimes, that you, uh, I know that uh, most people, it's just you're up there for a matter of days, and you land your first one. Yeah, it was, uh, I remember one of my, uh, it's a murder trial, and I'd probably been on six, seven years in the unit at that point. The defense attorney was crossing me over an interview technique I'd used in an interview of a suspect. I was like, we've obviously had so much training in this. And I had to start. I was like, ma'am, I've had no training. You know, it's all on-the-job training. She assumed I went to schools and learned about how to interview and interrogate people, and that simply wasn't the fact. You learned as you went, and that's why I refer back to those years on patrol were so valuable. And that's a good point, too, for people that uh, might be interested in moving into death investigations that are on the road now. If if you were to talk to one of those people and you knew that was their goal, how would you sum up some advice to a patrol officer about how to how to achieve that goal? What do you need? What do they need to do right now? First of all, they got to care. You know, they you may not be doing the job you want right now, but do that job the, to the best that you can. And that'll only reflect on you because as you know detectives when they receive reports they read those reports and if you do a half-assed job well then you're known as a half-ass officer so when you're out there taking a a report you need to treat it like it's extremely important because of who's going to read it and also they you know we get called and say hey we all do this interview and like we we're certainly glad to help but why don't you want to well we're you know we don't really do these interviews and matt brother and i always used to tell him it's like you do more interviews in a day than we do a week. 
Consider every call you go on an interview. You're interviewing the victim. You're interviewing the neighbor. There may be a suspect. Go ahead and talk to them as well. So just treat those opportunities as learning opportunities. Yeah, grab it while you got a chance. And, and you make a good point, but I think what stops a lot of people is that you said, too, that that position has an elevated status inside police departments. Sometimes I think it's it's a it's incorrect the way people look at it. Like a lot of people think it's a, a prideful position or a glory position. And and I've always said that very few things will deliver humility to somebody like that will. I think the only other way you could get humility harder would would be to play Fortnite and let an eight year old beat you. Right. Don't be knocking on your stepson, Jeff. <laughs> no, Jasper exactly. here. Come on. I, yeah, exactly. But yeah, seriously, is it I think that the, the perception from the outside, because of movies and TV is it looks like some big dream job. And Dr. Greg Davis, we interviewed him a while back, and he referred to that same thing in medicine as people think that they have a perception of it that's not real. So that's important things for people to know, especially if they're out on the road, is to develop those skills early. Yeah, and people will come up and ask me, and it's like, well, is it just like the movies or just like TV? I'm like, maybe two minutes of it. I go, the rest of it is you're documenting what you did. You're putting your case file together. You're talking with the attorneys, the prosecutor. You're talking with your supervisors. You're getting to-do lists ready to go, what you need to get done after the arrest. Yeah, they don't show that in the movies because it's not sexy. Oh, yeah, exactly. But, yeah, there's a lot of work behind the scenes that needs to get done after you put the handcuffs on. Huge. For example, the days of when you had to – proofread a, an interview transcript and the interview yeah. was four hours long yes. and you know we had fantastic staff assistants and bureau of investigation at Lexington police department you get to be good friends with all of them absolutely and is the thing is is that you still have to read that work because they're trying to understand what we're saying in that interview but i remember hours with an ink pen going through that and because it still has to be accurate and you're right people from the outside don't see that yeah, but yeah, that you're right. That staff, Brenda Estes, who just passed, uh, Sandy Jordan, who's up there right now, they we couldn't do it without them. Exactly. Uh, I stay in touch with Linda Cummins. I mm-hmm. mean, and a, a bunch of them, and their names are going to fail me, and I'm going to feel really bad about that here in a minute. But for that's another thing too. When I think people from the outside that are curious about this world, I don't know if they realize how much those those people in those positions know about everything you and I did. Right. They knew more than the supervisors did. Oh, oh, without a doubt. Yeah, because everything that went into the, into the dictation tank and all of that kind of stuff, it was amazing. The ability for them to pack that knowledge around. And, of course, right. they, they kept the secret like everybody else did. They were amazing people for that. Uh, another thing that always interested me about the fact verse fictions. Yeah, I, I love crime novels, fiction novels, the, the Prey series, the Harry Bosch novels. And there's like, how real are those? I was like, a lot of them are fairly accurate. Until the end where the bad guy pulls a gun on the cop and the cop gets to kill him and it never goes to trial. You know, it's like, you know who did it. But at that point of the time of the shootout, do you have enough to charge him? A lot of times you don't. So it just, you know, it wraps it up with a nice little bow. But in reality, that hardly ever happens. And you got to put the cuffs on and really defend your case in court. Exactly. Dot those eyes and cross the T's for sure. So when you get up there and you're baptized in the fire, you're learning as you go. And I'm going to agree with you that that group of people you listed would probably be the A team as far as developing people. I have no doubt because I got to work with all of them, too. Mm -hmm. How did that progress? For example, do you remember the first case you got? Well, I started out, I think, as well they should have. I got assigned to robbery. And I was like a second on a couple of murders uh, with Chris Coonover. Megan Liebengood, we did that. I was his number two on that. I think that was 2004, and I got up there in 2002. But, yeah, my first case as a lead investigator in a homicide was Kelly Gray. We got called over to Venetian Road over near Center Parkway. Female white with a gunshot wound to the head. It appeared to be suicide. Something just didn't look right. The angle, like the the entrance wound was closer to the back of her head as opposed to the side. As you well know, it's like there's never any perfect suicide scene. There's always a question that a family member will be like, it, it's not suicide, it's murder, it's murder. And you just have to work through that. And we so we pulled the two sons down to headquarters to do formal interviews to them, see who was the last time to talk to mom. And just through the course of the investigation, their stories weren't adding up. And we finally focused in on Kelly, who was the last one to see her. And Kelly had some mental issues. 
And we finally got him to confess that he had gone through a moment and believed he was saving his mom's soul and wound up shooting her in the back of the head with a three fifty seven. So that was my first one. That was a good one to learn on. I leaned a lot on Chris that entire night. He was walking me through it and telling me, I think you need to interview this guy next because he's the next step. So, you know, I never quit learning from Chris. And up until my last year, I was still asking advice. You know, you, you can never learn too much about an investigation. It, for sure. And what a case to get to, because it sounds like you got handled a genuine mental health issue. It was. I think he got the appropriate sentence. He was sent to a, a mental institution uh, for, I think, probably close to a decade until, you know, the doctors viewed that he wasn't a danger to society anymore. Yeah. People uh, people don't understand that. Maybe we'll do a show on that one time because you have people that – I don't think they understand how hard that is, how hard that is to feign that and how the system has a lot of evaluations in place to catch that. But when you get one of those, that's a different challenge. Different it challenge. It is. You got a couple extra hurdles to get over. The Brenda Cowan murder. A lot of people, Matt Brothers and I, he was the lead on it. We tried to interview the suspect and people came out, oh, he's just pretending to be crazy. And we're like, no. He's mentally ill. He truly was. This wasn't somebody trying to get away with anything. He was having people speak to him in his head. And, you know, it's, I can't say I've never been fooled, but it's, you recognize fairly early on when someone has a true mental illness. It's it's darn near unfakeable. Right. And Brenda Cowan, by the way, was a Lexington firefighter that was killed in the line of duty by, by that suspect. And, and you're right, it, uh, it stands out. It stands out. Because I had them feign. I had a guy arrested and charged with murder one time. And, and I guess he thought after he, after he gave me his statement that he should throw the mental thing in. And he started looking at the doorway like he was talking to his stepson. And I was like, okay, y'all have this conversation. I'm going to go finish your paperwork. And uh, that one you could see a mile away. Well, how did you, it, during this career, I mean, 20 years is a long time in that unit. Tell us about how you migrated or got into the cold case investigation and and how that was. Well, the first cold case unit got started up, uh, was it 10, 12 years ago, roughly? Chris Schoonover, we got a federal grant to create a cold case. And at that point, Chris was the, without a doubt, the obvious choice to be the investigator in that. Uh, James Curlis was still the lieutenant and Paul Williams was the sergeant. And Chris. Did great work. He's so dedicated and so meticulous. Um, I really admired him for him. I just sit there and watch him read in his office for eight hours a day sometimes. Just going over old case files, old case files, taking notes, getting to-do lists. And so I'm lucky I got to watch him do that for when my time came around. Chris did a lot of good work. I believe he closed one or two old murders. And then finally the, the funding had dried up. And, you know, we're always worried about staffing positions in the police department. I believe it became considered a non-essential position. And so they ended at, ended that, and Chris uh, continued on for a little bit longer and then soon after retired. And then a couple of years go by, and Commander Albert Johnson, I believe in January of 2019, recommended to Chief Weathers that we reopen it. Chief Weathers gave his blessing, and Commander Johnson asked me if I'd run the unit and was happy to do so. That's interesting stuff. And the idea that, again, people in the community don't understand is that everything inside of a police department is based on budgets. And I've always said that they are a business. They usually take up most of the operating capital in a, in a local government. Yes. And as much as we would like to believe that the police departments and the state police and the FBI are just like on TV where people are tirelessly pounding away and they are, there's a limit, and especially when budgets get tight. And, mm-hmm. and unfortunately, things like cold case do become kind of like luxuries. Yeah, they're, it's fringe, and uh, you can say all you want, but the backbone of any police department is the Bureau of Patrol. Amen. You have to have those guys on the street answering 911 emergency calls. So that's what you have to take care of as a chief of police. You have to make sure the Bureau of Patrol is taken care of. Anything after that, then – I think the clear unit is fantastic, the neighborhood officers, but it's the people that are frontliners in the community. Those are the essential personnel. Then I think the investigators come in and then, you know, a cold case because 
I think it's very needed, but it's not necessary, um, if that makes any sense. But certain spots have to be filled before you get luxury positions. Let me ask you this. How does a case get cold and what does that mean? Well, in our unit, we don't really have any hard lines of when it's cold. Um, You could work a case for eight months and it still be hot. As long as you're doing stuff or there's stuff to be done, that primary investigator will stay with it. And even when it does go cold, as long as that detective is still in the unit, that case stays with him. Like, I never solved my very first murder. I have it in 2002. Well, that was my second one. It, It stayed with me even though I wound up going to cold case, but it would have stayed with me as long as I stayed in the unit. So the only time it really gets defined cold as coming to the cold case unit is it remains unsolved and the lead detective retires, transfers out or something like that. Then that case file would move to the cold case unit. Well, some people would ask, and again, um, maybe it's not unreasonable. Why do they even get cold at all? What what are the things that get in the way of working a case? Even if a case is hot, are there things that, that, as much as we may not care for them, they get in the way? The biggest thing that will slow down an investigation by far is lack of community cooperation. For every hundred murders that happens in Lexington, I'd say the homicide unit knows who did it 90, 95% of the time. But when you don't have you know, the community assisting when they have knowledge and refuse to share it. You know, the DNA is great and ballistics are great, but nothing beats witnesses cooperating with the police department to secure an arrest and a conviction. And it's fundamental to our system of justice. Absolutely. Is that I've ranted a little bit and I won't rant a lot today about how it's actually part of your social contract that if you want to live in a civilized society, you have to dip in. And It's frustrating because I know we hear a lot of times, well, people are afraid to come forward. And it was my experience, and I don't think this has changed, that that exists, but it is not the entire piece of the pie if you break it down. Because there are people that just don't because they won't. Correct. I can remember one time interviewing a witness that after we'd identified a suspect and she actually watched a guy get stabbed to death with a screwdriver and get rolled up in a carpet and drug out out of the apartment. And once I took her statement, I actually just asked her politely, I said, is there any reason why you didn't bring this forward you before? Just wanted to know. And her exact response was, because it was none of my damn business. And I'm like, okay, that's not fear or anything. But I think that's a problem that we need to have addressed because I'm pretty sure it's killing the unit right now. Yeah, I actually had a murder individual who was shot in a drive-by and his sister was standing right there and knew the shooter. And I get the information. I was like, oh, this is going to be a quick one to solve. She refused to cooperate. And I was like, why wouldn't you help me catch the person that killed your brother? And she said, I ain't no snitch. And I was, I was, I didn't know what to say at that point. It becomes its own cultural phenomenon. Like it's, it's unreal. Like it, it starts to defeat itself. And again, there's no rhyme or reason to that except because. Yeah. And when people bark at us for not being able to solve a murder, you just want to point to that. Yeah. Cause I remember when I was in the unit and then I had that the short stint of uh, when I, part of the uh, units that I supervised was that unit was how many times people in a family would call and yell at a detective and not always yelling demented, more out of frustration and say things like everybody knows who did this and they were probably right. Yes. But the only response you had was everybody, but us knows who did that. So that's a frustrating thing. Yeah. And you get to the point where it's like, ma'am, I'm sorry we haven't made an arrest in this case, but Would you please go talk to your nephew? Because he has the information that will give me probable cause to make an arrest. I've talked to him three times. He refuses to speak with me. If you have any influence over him, I recommend you speak with him and have him come down to headquarters because he's holding the key to the gate. Right. There's uh, there are so many binders up in that unit and all over the country that have names of people that are high likelihood. And again, they have connect the dot people all the way up to that name. Yes. And and that's that's a sign of a very good investigation. The only failure is on the community side at that point yeah. to, to at least meet halfway and say, OK, I can make that connection between these two dots. And there are certain situations where. I kind of understand their predicament. I don't live in that neighborhood, but not all of it is fear of retaliation. It's just I refuse to cooperate with the police department, you know, so it's. In, in a situation where, okay, I live down the street from the suspect. If he sees you all knocking on my door and you all come in for an hour, then I'm going to have problems. 
And I get that, but that's not the case all the time. Exactly. And I think that's my thing with it that I'm trying to get across is that we can't paint that pic with a wide brush like Correct. That. That's very misleading. That, And again, kind of like with mental health, is even though you're not a mental health professional, when you start meeting people, you start to get an idea that this is probably going to be the case. And yes. the same thing when you're talking to witnesses and things like that, you pretty quick put together whether it's a valid concern because we have had people. But again, it's not the biggest bulk. You know, there's there's been shootings where there literally are scores of people standing there. I mean, literally scores. And they're watching what happened. And when the police get there, nobody saw a thing. And there, that's the cultural deficit in that, too. Not even the anonymous tip, because right. we want them. You, you want the witness statement. But holy cow, just the tip to launch it would be great. Yes. Well, good stuff. Now, when a case winds up. In that status where it, it hasn't moved for a while and you're a cold case investigator where a department is has the luxury at any given time to have a cold case investigator or, or more, is there training available for cold case investigators? There is. Uh, there's not much. The department sent me to one in Washington, D.C. this past May. Uh, it was very beneficial. So there is training out there. There were federal agencies, state police, local detectives, uh prosecutors, uh, medical examiners. There's about 200 people there. It was very informative. Yeah, that sounds good. Because I guess the the reason I wanted to back into that is that how do we decide which ones get looked at? And that probably means a lot to victims' families. For sure. Well, I thought I had a brilliant idea of how to approach that, but I never got a chance. It was we hit the ground running. What I wanted to do was, and Lexington's a fortunate size city for a cold case investigator. We there's probably, I think, 60, 65 cases assigned to the cold case unit that are unsolved murders. Uh, we also have a couple of missing person cases that we believe to be homicide. But when Albert Johnson asked me to take over the unit, my idea was to sit, take a month off. Um, just sit at my desk. I'm not answering my phone. I'm not doing anything. I want to go through every single case file and separate them into categories. I believe these to be potential DNA cases and set those 12 to the side. This has legs as far as I think with a couple of new interviews, maybe we can break through what the original detectives said and already pushed close to the line. Um, so set those aside and then maybe read the ones that are too old. Pieces of the, the case file have gone missing. The probability of solving them is, is really low. So I don't want to waste too much time with those. I'm not going to forget about them. But let's go to, say, the low-hanging fruit first with the DNA. Go through all of those, submit a bunch of lab requests, and send them off to you know, KSP Lab. Hopefully something comes back. And while I'm waiting on those, I'm selecting case files that is going to be old-fashioned detective work, knocking on doors and re-interviewing people, finding new people to interview. So that was my plan. But <laughs> it was funny when Albert asked me to take it over. He's like, would you want to do this? It's like, well, on one condition – Don't make me work the Melanie Flynn case. I was like, and not out of any disregard for Miss Flynn or her family. I know good investigators have gone through that case with a fine tooth comb and really good investigators. And it's like, if they didn't find anything, I'm not going to. And I saw Chris work very hard on that case. In fact, it was kind of pressured from the higher ups to get some resolution for that case. So he spent, you know, a year more running. He went to Tennessee, New York, interviewing people. So he put in a lot of good work. And me having so much reverence for Chris, he spent a year and a half on that. There's not one thing I could come up with in that case file that Chris Schoonover hadn't already thought of. So I was like, Albert, I think we'd be doing a disservice to all these other cases that I think have potential. And he's like, I agree. It's like, it's your unit. You handle the cases like you want. I bet I started that job and day five I get a call about the Melanie Flynn case. And, you know, you get that feeling when you're talking to somebody on the phone. It's like it kind of rings true. Guy, I'm going to need to go talk to this guy. Before you know it, I was sucked right in. And uh, we spent a solid six months. You know, I traveled out to California, some federal prisons, talked to some individuals out there and just kind of dove back into it. And, uh you know, it was really interesting. We're not done. There's still some things that uh, I need to do. I, I keep in touch uh, somewhat with the the brothers of Melanie, Brad and Doug, 
you know, I, I told him, it's like, I'm not promising you anything, but I'm going to promise you that I'm going to look into it and I'm going to try and I'm going to exhaust, you know, everything we can. So that's still not done, but it was kind of funny. It's like, we hadn't had a tip on that case in years. And, you know, five days after I say, I'll do this, but I, you know, I want to work on these other cases that I got sucked in. And we spent months down at the Kentucky river with backhoes and, you know, ground penetrating radar. And so it, I could see how Chris got sucked into it. And again, it's it, you made a good point. It's nothing against the uh, the victim or the family, but you have to triage cases. And I'm going to go along with you. I've never heard it put that way, but it was fine tooth comb year over. I mean, over the years, it's never sat. I think that in the public, some people think it's sat and Correct. alive and well. I've looked at it. Mm-hmm. I mean, most of us, you know, when I was commanding that unit, sure. and even when I was back in, in, all of us have taken a look at it in a lot of eyes. And that's not saying somebody could miss it, but they do get to a point. Most cases will get to the point that absent something truly new coming in, mm-hmm. that they stagnate, that there's the cold case element. On that case, for sure, I think you, that it's important for people to hear that as sporadic as they are, as information does come in mm-hmm. on that. For the people who have never heard, because we're making them assumptions here, tell us about that. what we're talking about. When you say Melanie Flynn, people locally we'll probably have an idea what that is, but what's the overall, when we say Melanie Flynn, what's uh-huh. that mean to the audience across the country? Well, it got its fame with a, a local book called The Bluegrass Conspiracy, and it's centered around corrupt Lexington police detectives. And we're certainly not, not going to cover anything up. They were very corrupt. Uh, they were criminals wearing badges, but they were involved in drug activity uh, to the cartel level. Uh, loose associations got, uh, there was a the murder of a federal judge, I believe, prosecutors, really scary stuff. But in in that, there's a Melanie Flynn was uh, dating or had a, a relationship with a detective with the Lexington Police Department, Bill Canaan. That relationship went sour, and shortly after that, Miss Flynn went missing. And the book talks about all the other stuff, the the drug smuggling, but it also brings along Melanie Flynn's cases. You know, more than likely the Lexington Police Department had something to do with her demise and certainly a theory. There are a couple of other theories, but that's what, you know, we've been looking at. Chris spent a lot of time looking at alternative theories because everybody had kind of exhausted the avenue to the Lexington Police Department. So, yeah, it was just a there was just so much work that went into that case. And the, the case files incredibly large. Just to read it would take five to six days. And what time frame are we talking? When did Melanie go missing? Uh, late 70s. Late 70s. So it's been some time. Yeah. it's uh, And I mentioned Doug and Brad Flynn. They've had a rough go. With them. And again, the relationship with the Lexington Police Department wasn't always great with them. And I've apologized to them. But it's a new day and age. And, you know, I promised them and I'd do my best and really thought we were on to something down at the river. And it still may be accurate. You know, it, just because we didn't find anything doesn't mean that it's not accurate. And, you know, I when I mentioned I flew out to a federal prison in California, went to interview a, an inmate who was a former detective with the Lexington Police Department, and he provided the information. It was hearsay information. It wasn't, you know, a smoking gun, so to speak. He's like, this is what I'd heard. And so that, that's kind of what led us to the river. And that's not the first time that that location on the river has been brought up. Well, wait, I have to ask something. I didn't realize that the person who was the inmate in California was a former detective. He was. Was he there because of this corruption or was No, he, he was. He ran with the people that, uh, it's no secret, Drew Thornton and Bill Canaan were the main people in the Bluegrass Conspiracy. He was a detective along with them. He was arrested by DEA in, I believe, the early 80s for drug running. And then a couple more charges, and he was a three strikes, you're out. So he's spending life in prison out of the federal pen in California. And that would that would have a sense of credence to it just oh. because of the association. So I could see where you would go with that. Yeah. It, and again, we talked to, I believe, Chris and Mike Malone, who was with the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, spoke to Bill Canaan in prison. They came away convinced that he didn't have any knowledge because – if he did, he could parlay that into a pardon. And, you know, he even says, like, boys, if I knew where she was, I could blame it on my dead friend, Drew Thornton, and y'all let me out of this prison, wouldn't you? And I was like, well, yeah. He's like, if I knew, I'd tell you because I don't like it in here. 
So, uh, you know, I think that holds a lot of credence to him saying he doesn't know what happened to her because he really could. He got a, he could have got his sentence cut much shorter than it was. Gotcha. Well, I'll tell you what. I posed the question to some of our listeners on social media several weeks ago, knowing that we were going to sit down with you and asked, does anybody have any any questions about the Melanie Flynn case? And granted, it's still an open, active investigation. And I know it frustrates people, but there's legitimate reasons why these things aren't shared. And uh, we could do a whole nother show on that. And I, I know right now I'm thinking of times when information leaks really hurt case investigations. Absolutely. So we know that, but I think some of the questions I saw that came through were actually pretty intuitive and pretty pretty insightful. So what we'll do is I'll have Wendy read those to you, and um, and we'll take it from there. And just to kind of help our listeners out, maybe to answer, because this is an opportunity people don't get, mm-hmm. is to speak to somebody that's been that close to it. Hey, you know there's more to the story, so go download the next episode like the true crime fan that you are. The Murder Police Podcast is hosted by Wendy and David Lyons and was created to honor the lives of crime victims so their names are never forgotten. It is produced, recorded, and edited by David Lyons. The Murder Police Podcast can be found on your favorite Apple or Android podcast platform, as well as at MurderPolicePodcast.com, where you will find show notes, transcripts, information about the presenters, and much, much more. We are also on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, which is closed captioned for those that are hearing impaired. Just search for the Murder Police Podcast and you will find us. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe for more and give us five stars and a written review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast from. Make sure to subscribe to the Murder Police Podcast and set your player to automatically download new episodes so you get the new ones as soon as they drop. And please tell your friends. Lock it down, Judy.